Climate change is destabilizing the Earth. The temperature is rising. Pollution is increasing, and some ecosystems are on the verge of collapsing. The reason behind this is the burning of fossil fuels and CO2 emissions. But we hear this often, that fossil fuel is running out. But they have been saying the same thing for decades now, don't they? Are fossil fuels really running out? Whatever the truth is, one thing is certain. With an increasing number of industries and vehicles on the road, fuel will become increasingly expensive, as will CO2 emissions. So it seems like climate change is now inevitable to stop. You might ask yourself frequently, why do we continue to use fossil fuels if we know they contribute to climate change and environmental issues? Why don't we simply quit using it? Simple as that, right? Well, it's a little more complicated than that. Record heat wave in Japan, major flooding in Australia, and a deadly avalanche in northern Italy. Emissions are expected to hit record levels. Largely end the use of fossil fuels. Europe is conveniently turning back to coal, no questions asked. Which many believe are linked by man-made climate change. The first significant energy transition occurred in the early 18th century when people began using coal instead of wood. And by the 1900s, coal had replaced biomass as the main industrial fuel, make up about half of all fuel use worldwide. Oil was the second emerging fuel after coal as the oil age began in 1859 with the development of the first commercial oil well in Pennsylvania. However, oil found its true identity in the transportation sector. The oil era really took off with the introduction of the Ford Model T in 1908 and the boom in personal transportation after World War II. Oil overtook coal to become the world's largest energy source in 1964. Oil resources are not as extensively distributed worldwide as coal, but oil has crucial advantages over coal. Fuels produced from oil are nearly ideal for transportation. They are energy-dense, averaging twice the energy content of coal by weight. But more importantly, they are liquid rather than solid, allowing the development of the internal combustion engine that drives transportation today. Most of the fossil fuel used to generate electricity in the 20th century. Fossil fuels are the backbone of the electricity system, generating 64% of today's global supply. The remaining 36% are from other sources such as hydropower, nuclear, and renewables. Energy transitions haven't just been moving in the direction of fossil fuels, They've also been moving steadily in the direction of fuels that are more convenient to use and more energy-dense than the fuels they replaced. However, there is a major drawback to using fossil fuels. We already know that the burning of fossil fuels releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, warming our planet more quickly than any other time in the geological record. Stopping this warming before it transforms our globe into something beyond recognition is one of the biggest issues facing humanity today. Since the transportation industry consumes 72% of all fossil fuels, we should put more and more EVs on the road, right? Therefore, it can lower the consumption of fossil fuels. Then again, how are we going to charge the batteries that will be utilized in EVs is another issue that comes to mind. We must use a renewable energy source to charge EV batteries. Otherwise, we only add another medium using the same source to the chain. Compared to batteries, gasoline has a far higher energy density per unit of weight a gas-powered vehicle can drive 360 miles on 77.5 pounds of gasoline. However, a same weight of battery in an EV can only go 21 miles. It needs a battery that weighs 1,334 pounds to travel the same distance, making the vehicle heavier and requiring more energy to recharge. However, the EV industry is constantly introducing new technology. We therefore hope that this EV issue can be resolved in the following years. The idea of electrifying everything is great in theory, but not everything can be done so easily. Fossil fuels have unique properties that are difficult to mimic, such as their energy density and capacity to produce extremely high temperatures. For processes that cannot be powered by electricity, the emissions issue cannot be solved by renewable electricity. The world needs energy-dense carbon-free fuels that can be burned and replicate the characteristics of fossil fuels for these operations. There are many possibilities, but they all have pro and cons, and often require more work to be economically and environmentally feasible. In some form or another, the sun provides all of our energy. Even with our current energy-intense lifestyles, the sun provides enough energy to the Earth for all of us. More than a thousand times as much solar energy as the annual global energy extraction from fossil fuels makes it to habitable land. 
This energy is diffuse, which is an issue. Energy is undoubtedly provided by the sun, which warms your skin. But you must focus that energy in order to operate a car or warm a house. Wind and solar power, in contrast to fossil fuels, can only produce electricity when the wind is blowing or the sun is shining. The real-time operation of the power grid presents an engineering problem, since power is generated and consumed simultaneously, with generation fluctuating to maintain system balance. Biofuels are a potential alternative since they release the same amount of carbon into the atmosphere when burned as they absorb during plant growth. Biofuels are not zero carbon, however, unless the entire process is powered by renewable or zero carbon energy as the processing necessary to convert plants into usable fuels requires energy and produces CO2 emissions. Given the emissions that result from moving the grain to processing facilities and turning it into fuel, for instance, corn ethanol blended into gasoline in the United States only emits on average 39% less CO2 than the gasoline it replaces. Despite being present for many years, Biofuels are currently a hot topic. People frequently use the terms first, second, and third generation biofuels to distinguish between the straightforward, conventional biofuels that have been in use for a while, and the more sophisticated, more advanced, and more efficient ones that are currently being developed. Vegetable oil, biodiesel, ethanol, and methanol are examples of first generation biofuels. Strong alcohols called ethanol and methanol are produced similarly to brewing from sugar, wheat, or corn. Second-generation biofuels, which include items like biohydrogen and mixed alcohols, are produced by converting plants into liquid fuels using more complex chemical processes. They release more energy per volume than first-generation biofuels, which allows you to travel further on a tank full of them. Algal oil produced in ponds or photobioreactors, which is refined to produce conventional fuels like biodiesel, methane, ethanol, and other substances, is used to create third-generation or advanced biofuels. What kind of impact could biofuels have? The International Energy Agency is one organization that has emphasized the immense potential. By 2050, almost 10 times more transportation fuel might be produced by biofuels than there would be today, according to the IEA. The size of South Korea, or around 100 million hectares, would be required for such a large-scale project. Burning fossil fuels releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which smothers Earth like a large invisible blanket and heats the globe. This is the issue known as global warming, which is beginning to disrupt the climate. Theoretically, biofuels don't have the same issue. When a tree expands, it takes in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and water from the soil. The carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in these molecules are then transformed by sunlight into more complex carbohydrate molecules that the tree stores. Photosynthesis is a process that is similar to combustion carried out in reverse. A tree absorbs carbon dioxide through photosynthesis and uses it to grow. The amount of carbon dioxide released during combustion of the tree when it is used as fuel at the end of its life is exactly equal to what the tree absorbed throughout growth. So theoretically speaking, biofuels are carbon neutral. Biofuels are increasingly appealing to cultivate as oil becomes more expensive. This suggests that farmers may discover they can make more money by planting biofuel crops than food crops, which could result in food shortages and higher food costs. Any increase in the price of essential commodities like wheat will have the greatest impact on people in developing nations. It's likely that in our eagerness to employ biofuels to combat global warming, we could make the world's hunger and poverty worse. Carbon capture and storage or use is a final possibility for stationary applications like heavy industry. Fossil fuels would still be burned and create CO2, but it would be captured instead of released into the atmosphere. The least expensive method for reducing emissions from large enterprises that use combustion is currently carbon capture. When considering how carbon capture might contribute to climate change reduction, we have to remember that fossil fuels are not the ultimate cause of the problem CO2 emissions are. If maintaining some fossil fuel use with carbon capture is the easiest way to deal with certain sources of emissions, that's still solving the fundamental problem. Science clearly demonstrates that we must redesign our energy infrastructure and get rid of CO2 emissions. But in addition to the engineering difficulties, dealing with climate change is also politically difficult. A multi-trillion dollar business that is essential to the economy and to people's daily lives must be reformed in order to reduce the effects of climate change. It takes immediate investments with hazy long-term returns in order to lessen humanity's dependency on fossil fuels. Politicians, who typically concentrate on measures with immediate local advantages that voters can see, find these choices extremely challenging. 
whether any climate policy is both big enough to matter and popular enough to happen. As the New York Times put it last year, current initiatives concentrate on lowering the greenhouse gas emissions caused by our energy-intensive lifestyles. But the second part of today's energy challenge is providing modern energy to the billion people in the developing world that don't currently have it. You don't hear as much about the second goal in the public discourse about climate change, but it's crucial that developing countries follow a cleaner path than the developed world did. The task is made more difficult by the need to supply developing nations with both more and cleaner energy, but a solution that ignores these nations is completely unsuitable. Do we currently have sufficient alternatives and technology to replace fossil fuels? For now, the answer is no. But the sooner we act, the better, if we want to prevent climate threats.